First of all, it's my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, former director of the Surface Logistics Center for the U.S. Coast Guard, and currently the executive director for Asset and Logistics, Mr. Ken Burgess. Thank you, Eric. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, my name is uh, Ken Burgess, and I am the exec executive director for Assets and Logistics within the DHS, or Department of Homeland Security, Office of Readiness Support. A couple things before I get started. Uh, thank you very much to the Asset Leadership Network for inviting me and, and, and my team to speak today. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, we got out assets and asset management uh, within the DHS Chief Readiness Support Office, uh, particularly within the Asset and Logistics Branch. And uh, I was also uh, enticed when I uh, saw an old clip when uh, there were a lot of references to McStorley's Pub in New York City. And uh, anybody likes McStorley's Pub, I, I, I'm, I'm very glad glad to talk to. And hopefully, maybe we could have a meeting there in the future. But I, we, we do appreciate the opportunity. Um, uh, first up, could uh, we go to the slides, please, uh, we, David? Yep, I've got the, just bring the slides up now. I just want to make sure everybody can see these fine. Okay. Next slide, if we could, David. Sure. All right. Thanks, David. And uh, the agenda, what I'd, what I'd like to do is um, walk through, just kind of give you an overview of real property within the uh, Department of Home and Security. Well, we'd like to make this a little interactive. I've got uh, two members of our real property team at DHS, uh, Greg Ewing, who's acting uh, Real Property Office Chief and uh, David Packerar, who he may be able to see, who uh, is a realty specialist. And they have uh, been active participants in leading this, this uh, journey uh, for us at DHS. Um, so I'll be bringing them about in about five, slide, slide five or six. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, if you, if you look at the mission of, of DHS, uh, DHS, First of all, it's the newest cabinet level apartment in the, in the United States government. It was formed by combining, uh, in a, roughly 2002, by combining 22 existing departments and agencies. And we, uh, so I walk, work in the Chief Readiness Support Office for Tom Shalecki, I, oh, I think he's uh, spoken here at the Leadership Network a couple of times. But um, we work for the Undersecretary of Management, Tex Al's, and then we have the Chief Readiness Support Office, and I work for Tom, again, as an executive director for assets and logistics. We're responsible for asset management and real property, logistics integration, personal property, think Eric Brown, aircraft, including small UAS, 50,000 motor vehicles, 60% of them law enforcement vehicles. Again, think Eric Brown and boats. But we're here today to talk primarily about real property, but we're open to uh, questions on, on any of our, our, our portfolio with DHS. Uh, next slide, please. When you look at our, our, our portfolio at DHS, I, I think a couple of uh, things st stand out. Uh, it is large. We have over 50,000 individual real property assets and a hundred, and that's a, a spread of over 100 million square feet total. So if you look at the left-hand uh, part of the slide as well, if you go down the bottom, uh, you see annual spend. We estimate that uh, the components DHS wide spend roughly $8 billion annually on real property. Uh, I have a financial ma manager background and, and, and that, that I got uh, financial management, so that's a very material figure. So when we look as, as to where we're focused on uh, with real property, um, why we're focused on real property, one, it is, it is, it is a very large, it's a material amount of the uh, budget of the, of the entire DHS um, um, uh, budget uh, annually, and so it's a, it's a it's a good place for efficiencies. Uh, our uh, um, motto is affordable readiness. Affordable readiness, um, where and and the and the definition of affordable readiness is balanced between operational effectiveness and dollar efficiency in meeting mission requirement. And what better way to fo focus uh, efficient. Um, um, affordable readiness than on an $8 billion real property portfolio. Uh, I, I think another thing of interest, if you go to the lower right-hand portion of the slide, uh, sometimes uh, with real property, you think, well, that's, you know, we're talking office space. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if we're totally unique across the government, but we certainly have a lot more 
uh, than just office space that we manage. If you, we, 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 when you look at law enforcement specialized and border inspection stations, roughly 20% of our portfolio. We've got some unique requirements, Coast Guard family housing for active duty members. And even, and even our warehouses in DHS really aren't warehouses. I'll call them, opera, they're operational support entities. We're talking about active, active distribution centers in FEMA. Um, and the Coast Guard has inventory control points that are actively um, pushing spare parts for their aircraft and cutters around the world. Um, next slide, please. When you look at the structure of DHS, uh, again, a large amount of uh, uh, components. I'll, I'll just go through some of the, what, I, what I'll call the major components, some of the larger components. Uh, CBP or Customers and Port Border Protection, if you look underneath the CRSO Office of Real Property tag there. Um, FEMA, ICE, uh, TSA, Coast Guard, and Secret Service. Um, what, uh, what is, uh, all, each of those uh, entities have been, been around a long time. Uh, they've got their own history. Um, they're very proud of their history. They have their own mission. Uh, they, they, they're all governed by different uh, congressional committees. Uh, they have unique funding authorities, unique funding, and the unique IT systems. So our challenge is when you look at that $8 billion portfolio and you reach across uh, these uh, 22 agencies and 12 with real property authority and all using unique systems, unique funding strategies, how do you get, how do you get around it from real property? How do, you, how do you create efficiencies in the $8 billion? How do you even track the $8 billion? Um, it has been our challenge and we've been at it for a while. And if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, Greg Ewing, are, are you with us? I'm here, Ken. Okay, so I'm going to uh, turn it over to Greg Ewing and uh, to talk about some of the challenges we faced. And uh, uh, Greg, if you can start off, what you, you've been at this a few years, you've done some great work externally with other agencies with OMB. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what do you think is the biggest challenge you faced? Well, like you said, Ken, you hit the nail on the head. Um, we have a large volume of components, um, very, very diverse. We have diverse mission sets, anywhere from guard on the border, respond to disasters, to law enforcement. Um, but each, each, each organization, each component that we're, we're trying to oversee has, and you said history, but it isn't just history, it's the development of their systems and processes that are unique to that specific component. Um, each one has their own funding streams. So we don't control the budget. Each this component controls a budget. So our, our influence is, it's difficult for the influence that way. Um, and, and not just in the budget, but each, some of them have their own congressional committees to, to put that money through. So it makes it very difficult. So how do we get the, to demonstrate that strategic mission alignment? But the biggest challenge that we've been trying to come up with is how do we get a handle on that? You threw out that 8 billion number. That, that, that's that's a, probably a good estimate, but still, we don't have a good solid, uh, what, do we, what do we spend on real property? And specifically being able to link up how much from a planning through to budgeting to execution uh, and then the execution. And how do we track those dollars and how do we get a handle on that? This is something that, that, that I've been working on, Dave's been working on me for about three, four years now. How do we get a handle on that and identify that gap? Um, we also run the trouble with the, the varying levels of planning capabilities. Some components have very good systems in place and processes. We can go out and ask for the capital investment plan. They'll show us where they're at. Other components, not so much. Uh, real an afterthought. Um, and so how to pull that together. And then the, consist the quality, the data quality. Um, again, I can't stress this enough, the multiple IT systems. We're talking different platforms, different uh, formats. The data that they're collecting. So it's very difficult. How do we pull that together so that we can get a, a solid um, comparison across components? And then, like I said, I already mentioned the wide range of funding streams. But this is something that we've been working on. Um, we, we're also working with uh, OMB and GSA and some other folks in the Federal Property Council on um, how do we get a handle on these costs? And what we're finding out isn't just a DHS problem. Other agencies are experiencing the same thing and try to get a handle on those real property costs. Could you talk a bit, just a little, expand on that just a little bit about the object class work you do with OMB, where you're yeah, at? Yeah, one of the things we do, we put together a, a working group to take a look at the, the budget object classifications. If you're familiar with uh, OMB A11, 
they have a standard structure for the budget offset classifications. However, there's nothing in there specifically for real property. They have it broken down. There's major categories for personnel costs, for contracting costs, for um, investments, but real property spans across that. So being able to get a handle on real property costs is very difficult. In fact, most real property ends up being buried in these different codes. So what we're working on is this is a work group project. This is multi um, AC, us, I know Veterans Administration, Department of Transportation, some other folks are very interested in working with us to set up a standard budget object classifications for real property. So that when people do their planning, when they submit their budgets to OMB, that real property will be, will be identified as a separate budget exhibit. So we get a real handle on exactly how much our real property spend is. We've gone ahead and identified cost pools all the way across the spectrum from investment to sustainment to disposal. And now we have those categories set up. Now what we're doing is we've been... Uh, kind of doing the tour around the different agencies, trying to generate some grassroots support for this effort. Um, from our perspective, most of the agencies are very receptive to this. They see the need for this. They understand that um, gaining that visibility into um, the more transparency and visibility we have into how we're spending our money is important. Uh, the problem is though, making those changes to A11. This is just pretty, those categories are pretty ingrained over the past, uh, I think 20 some 30 years. So. That's the change we're working on right now. And like I said, it's one of the areas that DHS is leading along with capital planning and workspace standards and things like that. All right, thanks, Greg. And, and so you hit the challenges very well and, uh, and uh, hit, I, I think, one area where we made a lot of progress, not there yet, um, but um, mm -hmm. certainly have uh, a plan in front of OMB that's gonna help us get our around a real property dollar, dollar figure, if nothing else. Yeah, um, not just us, but other agencies across other the agencies. world. Yes. Yep. Um, Okay, uh, so we'll go to the next slide, please. Okay, now, now I'd like to do, introduce David Packerar. Again, he works in real property uh, for a, uh, assets and logistics within DHS, works, works, works for Greg and I. And he has really been uh, a stalwart in, in moving us forward uh, with many initiatives um, across DHS. Again, uh, trying to uh, Get our get our arms around this eight eight, eight billion dollar portfolio in, in, in real property, um, with a moving towards affordable readiness. But please go ahead, David. Great, thanks, thanks a lot, Ken. Um, so, like Ken was saying, um, and Greg was saying, there's you know a lot of challenges, obviously, in uh, in terms of the scope of what we're looking at. Um, what we have found in terms of actually moving forward and making. Uh, progress is really just building on what foundations were um, already put in, in, in the past and making incremental improvements. So um, we've made significant improvements in this current year, but it's really built on largely what was done primarily in FY27, in FY17, 2017. So um, like uh, Ken was saying, our office is largely a policy office and we um, the one big piece of movement that we made to make progress here in 2017 was the issuance of um, policy on requirements for doing strategic capital planning. That's really kind of the foundation that we built off of. Once we've got that policy in place, since 2017, we've been doing um, financial um, assessments, going out to the components. We've got a DHS real property budget exhibit, as well as a projects exhibit that captures uh, what the spend is broken down into those categorizations that um, Greg had identified. We've been working and really leveraging that to get our better understanding of what our needs are and what gaps are. We've also been working um, extensively with OMB, as Greg was mentioning, um, working with that BOAC um, group, that working group. Um, we've also been working with um, OMB also on the capital planning group. So. Um, OMB issued the M2003 uh, memo, and what you'll notice in that M2003 memo is that it aligns very closely with this policy that was issued in uh, 2017. So it was largely based off that policy that we've um, that we were put out there. Um, then also towards the end of 2017, end of 2019 with the identification and the release of that M2003, um, our leadership has made this capability a strategic priority. It's in the CRSO strategic plan uh, to improve this capability. So 
with that leverage, we were able this year to make ex, ex, really extraordinary progress within the period of year. So we initiated a program that essentially formalized um, the improvement of this capability, partnering across different um, lines of business, across all the uh, components with legal um, uh, with legal interest um, um, authorities, um, as, as Ken had indicated earlier, um, understanding what the scope of the existing federal requirements are, what our existing capabilities are, come up with a way to look to implement the improvements, um, look at the financial, spend a lot of time looking at public data, looking at internal data, looking at the results, the financial assessments. Um, and what we put together was um, a DHS real property asset management system manual. This is kind of um, really our, um, our key of our key to success for 2020 along with actual DHS uh, real property capital plan. So, um, on the actual system manual, this system manual was put together to meet the requirements of OMB's M2003, which has requirements there for improving policy. Um, the development of it was taken um, based off of recommendations from GAO. So you obviously are, well, I'm sure a lot here are familiar with GAO's report um, on asset management and the recommendations there. And um, the foundation and the framework for this manual were put together using ISO 55000 um, as a framework to tie together the strategic plan to leadership, to actual operations, to measuring the performance, to improvements, to um, going back to the context. Um, so that, that's the framework that we had put together. So we've been able to make lots of progress to move this forward. Um, it's, it's obviously not going to be a, an easy lift, but um, thankfully, we've, we've, uh, with the support of leadership, with our leadership here, um, we've been able to make that support. And the last thing I'll note on the success for 2020, um, we had mentioned uh, partnering with components and other CXOs. Um, we've been spending a lot of time partnering with our CFO office. They've really been um, crucial, and it's obviously a requirement of M2003 to have that partnership. Um, but that has been uh, very much a key to our success is that partnership with um, the CFO. Moving on to 2021, um, we've got the framework in place. We've got that put together. What we're focusing on now is um, actually launching that. So there are um, strategic priorities, again, to uh, move this forward as part of the secretary's guidance. Um, there's a requirement to identify real property spend in the next PPPE cycle, so the cycle for 23 through 27. Um, and we are facilitating meeting that requirement through the framework that we had just um, talked. Um, the, we're also working on actually formalizing this and revising the policy. So what we've put together so far is currently in draft and is being uh, finalized. We're working with our components to collect those um, uh, feedback and responses uh, in terms of improving what we have drafted um, and we're looking to um, formally make that policy. Um, then we're looking to leverage the, uh, our PMRs, the program management reviews, uh, to improve the, um, uh, the results as part of the improvement process. Um, and again, I mentioned that, that uh, planning for the next cycle. Again, the next cycle is 23 through 27. Um, so we're working that in partnership with a CFO. Um, data, that's obviously another big area. Greg touched on that and that's, that's it's a challenge and there's, there's really lots of improvement that I think is um, required there and then your typical change management and communication that we need. So that's really what we're focusing on for 2021. Um, then I'll go ahead and touch on um, lessons learned and then I'll hand it over to, uh, back to Ken. Um, in terms of lessons learned, what we've found is, I mean, really the, the top, my top lessons learned is really the leadership um, buy-in and actually their support. That has really been key. This has been a priority for um, Ken and Tom. Um, and because of that, that um, identification of this as a strategic priority, we've been able to have success. So that is um, a key lessons learned. Um, change management is always a challenge, um, and again, given the structure that we have, um, there's, that's, that's something that is always, you have to come into 
any kind of change like this with a, um, a change management thought in and make sure you have pol apply these policies. Um, other things that I'll note over here is make sure that you know we're partnering. What we really try and focus on is transparency with all the stakeholders, with our components, with uh, different stakeholders within our office, within CFO. Um, but a transparency on what we're doing, where we're going, why we're doing it, um, and make sure that we continuously have that loop um, and everybody feels that they have a, a say in, um, in the direction that we're going. Um, there's obviously best practices out there that, you know, I know we, we are focusing on GAO, OMB, um, ISO, et cetera. Um, and then uh, the, the last thing I'll note over here is just the data. There's, you know, so much data that's out there um, one area that we've been able to use, you know, uh, Greg had mentioned that, that A11, Section 83, it's got the budget object classes over there. Um, it's not, you know, it's not perfect in terms of the identification of the spend relative to the life cycle of real property. Um, however, um, there are some sections there that are specifically for real property that, you know, you've got the 32.0 that shows improvement to land and structures and, and others. So, um, that's all public information. We just log on to USA Spend and download it. Um, so we've been able to use that, obviously, on top of the internal data that we have as well. So um, that's, that's um, I think I'll just leave it here. Ken, I'll pass it over back to you. Okay, thanks, David. And it just, uh, David, uh, hit the nail on the head. Uh, change management um, is real hard um, and it's a journey. Um, we think it's uh, it's very much worth the journey in real property, um, but uh, I, I guess the be in my in my world, uh, you know, you've got the crisis of the day. We we uh, in the asset logistics shop are managing a distribution of 178 three million dollars in CARE Act funding for uh, PPE throughout the department. Um, we've got a lot going on, a lot of risk with the, with the burgeoning. Uh, a, a small UAS, large UAS, unaccompanied aircraft system industry, and the threat, you know, the counter threats, the threats that they, they that it could be for law enforcement agencies. But uh, uh, Tom Shalecki, uh, who is our boss, um, always comes back to what's going on with real property. And, um, uh, you know, I can't emphasize that enough. We, we're, we're on the cusp of uh, really doing some, uh, I think, outstanding things and get, get our arms around real property. But it does take 100% uh, commitment and drive, uh, and uh, and high cover um, to to get to get where you need to go. And, and we we're fortunate we've had that with Tom Shalecki, and we're we're going to keep moving forward. But I think that any I've been involved with it, with the Coast Guard with several change management uh, in my previous career with, with change management, and it all starts at the top. So uh, we can. I uh, any questions at all, or do we want to wait, or uh, or I could turn it over to Eric Brown. Yeah, well, Ken, believe it or not, I have a, a questions that have popped up um, yeah. while you're talking. So uh, one of them is from Scott Mason, and one of the best practices, excuse me, <clears throat> one of the best practices of the ISO 55,000 training is to begin implementation with, with uh, smaller manageable chunks. How do you see the promulgation or requirement on component agencies of the DHS RP uh, asset management system manual since it appears to be uh, all encompassing in terms of requirements. Well, I, I, I'll let David, uh, what, and, and throughout this journey, we, you know, we started in 2017 and uh, yeah, a manual can be all encompassing. And, uh, but um, the fact of the matter is what, what we look for is progress. And uh, for instance, uh, we're, we're getting ready to include real property budget exhibits into its 2023 uh, departmental budget, uh, we we've been at it two or three. We've been out this now, actually three or four years um, before we made that decision. Um, you know, we were ready to go. So, so um, I, I think uh, certainly, uh, you know, the, the good news that you get a uh, um, instruction out there or a manual it, um, is it gives someone a foundation, it gives someone a roadmap to success, and then I guess it's our job. Uh, well, it is our job. Uh, within the department to prioritize where we want to make the most success and make sure the components aren't just just going crazy trying to meet everything. But that, that's a very good question. I do know, for instance, in the Coast Guard, when we modernized uh, logistics and engineering across the surface communities, surface being cutters and boats, and I was at that journey for 10 years, uh, we didn't start with uh, polar 
polar ice breakers or national security cutters, we started with the smallest boats we could. <laughs> so, um, so, so you're right um, uh, um, in that what you want to do is start small, have success and build out. And so we're going to try to combine that with, with a template that we have with the, with the, with the asset man, man management. Yeah, and Ken, if I can add on to that, I, I think, you know, that's, that's a great question, a great comment. Um, and, but the reality is, is that what we have put together there in a manual, it's, it's not necessarily revolutionary to our current policy. You know, there's different, lots of different management systems out there um, and our existing policies that we've had in place um, does not, I can't, I wouldn't say that the, that this, that the revision to the instruction, the 25204001 is going to be a night and day thing. We have been building on successes that we've had in the, in the past and in, on processes that we have in the past. Uh, the existing policy has been out there since 2017. We've had a lot of success in terms of getting better understanding of what the spend is. Um, the process overall is based on the um, our you know overall funding process when it comes to the uh, PPPE process. That is something that's been out there for years. So it, it's not it's not a night and day thing. We have been working on building off of what we what we're doing. And again, the reality is, is once this policy goes out there and the uh, um, the manual goes out, it's not going to be a switch. You know, it's really a change management pro progress a process. Every component has different levels of maturity, different capabilities, different challenges, different data sets. Um, and what the, what the, you know, what Tom always says is, is not, we often can't control the velocity on where we go. We can control the direction. And that has been communicated to me as a lot leadership priority of we're focusing on a direction, getting movement towards that direction, towards improvement. Um, and we, you know, obviously are trying to move forward as quickly as possible, but it's, it's going to take some time. Well, I do have another question for Ken and team um, from Ms. Cecilia Moat. Um, given the diverse and segmented nature of your stakeholders, how much do you share the fundamentals of ISO 55000 and 55001 with those stakeholders to get a common understanding of the ta and taxonomy. Uh, she said she loved the idea that budget process is heading in that direction to capture the information. You wanna give a shot at that one, David? Sure, so yeah, the, the, the structure that's there is, um, that, that's really key. So um, understanding what the life cycle cost is of the program, that's really key to understanding what the needs are um, what the actual spend is and the gap between, you know, um, in terms of what your gap is um, on the financial side association with risk. Um, so having that structure there is really key. Um, the work that Greg has been doing with OMB in terms of getting that structure um, improved from what's there in um, section um, 83 of A11, OMB circular A11, um, that is really key. Um, what I will say would say is that um, since about 2017, we have been having our budget exhibits to all components already in that structure, um, essentially showing the life cycle of the invest slash um, acquire, going into sustain, going into uh, disposal, and then overhead. So that's pretty much been the breakdown and then a su subsection between owned and lease. So we have had that and we're working to improve that. So um, the work that Greg has been doing with OMB um, is um, really crucial to getting that structure across the board. Um, what again, I will say is, is that, you know, for component, for other groups that may be looking to improve on this capability, um, the existing structure, there is some, there is some foundation there. Again, you know, you look at um, what's there in terms of 32.0 on improvements to landed structures, 25.4, 23.1, 23.2. There are, you know, a good amount of uh, structure there. It's not, it's not exactly what we're looking for. It doesn't actually match our budget exhibit. Um, however, there is a foundation to go off of, and I think that's really key. Looking at where we are right now in terms of existing capability, and then making adjustments to get that um, that uh, forward momentum. And Thank I like you. David. That existing structure is there. And that gets us that gets us so far to a certain point because we can find those uh, real property costs. 
But again, it's, 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 it's very difficult. As you know, we've, we've been at this for a couple of years now. How we, how we go ahead and dig through and pull that out. And is this really real property cost? How come it was over there? Um, and like you said, the key, the key that really unlocks this is we get those budget object classifications embedded into A11. So now what that does, that embeds it into our budgeting and our execution systems. So it becomes embedded in there. So then it's just a matter of rolling up those costs as we need to, to pull that out. Absolutely, yeah. Data quality is is always a challenge. You can have the structure there, but if uh, uh, crap and it, it's you, you know you know how to you know routine. Oh yeah. So I see no more questions in the chat or in the Q and A. Um, are there any questions that you guys see, Nick or um, Mike? Hey, Eric. Eric. Is Keith, can I ask a question? Go right ahead, sir. Uh, hey, Ken, nice presentation and from you and your team. Uh, my question is kind of about the current situation. Uh, we're all kind of sitting at home, kind of looks that way. Um, I was wondering if uh, the higher ups were asking you to think about when the pandemic is over, are there going to be lasting changes as to how DHS uses real property moving forward? And yeah. are you thinking about those now? Uh, yeah, and uh, um, uh, Tom had one session. We, got, we have a second session uh, next week with across the components with their chief admin officers. But I mean, if you look at us, uh, you know, we talk about square footage, and everything is really based on the number of people in the seats, you know, in the square footage. And um, now uh, that's really going to, you know, that that could significantly change because you you really don't want people restricted, for instance, uh, you know, if, if this is going to continue on. Uh, also, uh, you look at, uh, for our office, for instance, uh, we are in the middle of DC and uh, we've been telecommuting. Uh, I started work at DHS April 13th of this year and uh, I, I have gone to the office one day. And one of the reasons for that, um, and I know people are in different telecommuting phases, but the vast majority of our folks either take the subway or take the bus, you know, take mass transportation. So perhaps something where being in a, in a urban market has been uh, lucrative in the past because of the transportation, if those transportation modes are no, now, uh, you know, hopefully it'll change a little bit, but maybe higher risk in the future. And you, you, you gotta, so, so it's really, it's, it's really a broad, a broad base of things that have to be considered, so. Yeah, 